ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय भगवते वासुदेवाय ओ नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय कश्चारयंथपितुर ओदन रच्युत बुक्षिताज ओदन मर्थ नोर्गति श्रद्धा क्षयो यम पीठम कश्चारयंथपितुर ओदन रच्युत बोलशो बुक्ष थाज ओदन मर्थ नोर्गति श्रद्धाक्षवो यम कश्चारयंथपितुर ओदन रामाच्युत वोलशो बुक्ष थाज ओदन मर्थ नोर्जति श्रद्धा क्षयो वो यम पिथम Grazing, 
Abidure, Abidure. Not far away, away. Odanam Food, Food. Rama, Achuta. Rama Achuta Lord Ram and Lord Achuta, Lord Ram and Lord Achuta. Va. Va From you, From you. Lasata, Lasata. Our desiring, Our desiring. Babukshito, Babukshito. Being, hungry. being hungry, Tayo, Tayo. For, them. for them, Dvija, Dvija. O, Brahmans. O Brahmans, Odanam, Odanam. Food, food. Artino, begging. begging, Yadi, Yadi. If, if. Shadha, Shadha. Any, faith. any faith, Cha, and, and va, va on your part, part. yachata please give, give. dharma vit tama o best knowers of the principles of religion <laughs> lord rama and lord achuta are tending their cows not far from here. They are hungry and want you to give them some of your food. Therefore, O Brahmins, O best of the knowers of religion, if you have faith, please give some food to them. Purport. The cowherd boys doubted the generosity of the Brahmins, and thus they used the word babukshito, meaning that Krishna and Balaram were hungry. The boys expected the Brahmins to know the Vedic injunction, anasya kshuditam patram. Anyone who is hungry is a fit candidate for receiving food in charity. But if the Brahmins would not recognize the authority of Krishna and Balaram, their titled Vija would be taken to mean merely born from two parents. V from two, Ja born, rather than twice born. When the Brahmins did not respond to the cowherd boy's initial request, the boys addressed the Brahmins with a slight trace of sarcasm as Dharma Vit Tama, O best of the knowers of religion. Timidandasya Gyananjana Chalakaya Chakshudun Militam Jena Asmai Sri Gurave Namaha Sri Chaitanya Mano Bhishtam Stapitam Ye Nabhutale Swayam Rupa Katam Mayam Tatati Swapadantikam Bandeham Sri Guru Sri Jutha Padakamalam Sri Guru Vaishnavamscha Sri Rupam Sagrajatham Sahagana Raghunatham Bidam Tham Sajivam Sadvaitam Sadvadutam Harijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padan Sahakana Lalita Sri Vishakan Vitanscha He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dinabandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Andamostate 
तत्कंसना गौरंगे राधे वृंदावनेश्वरी वृषभानु सुधे देवी प्रणमा हरि प्रिय कल्पतरूप्य कृपा सिंधुभ्य पतिथानिभ्य वैष्णवेभ्य नमो नम श्रीकृष्णा चैतन्य प्रभो निनंद श्रीअतराधर श्रीवासि गौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा कृष्ण कृष्ण हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे Lord Rama and Lord Achuta are tending their cows not far from here. They are hungry and want you to give them some of your food. Therefore, O Brahmins, O best of the knowers of religion, if you have faith, please give some food to them. We are reading today from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 10, text 23, entitled, The Brahmin's Wives Blessed, text number 7. In the previous chapter, Krishna revealed the pure devotion, the unmotivated, loving service of the young gopis in the pastime where he took their clothes high on a Kadamba tree while they were taking their baths in River Yamuna. In this wonderful pastime, we learn how in order to really come before the Lord, and receive the true reciprocation of the Lord that the soul, the heart, is yearning for. We must relinquish the external artificial garment of our ahankar or false ego where we identify with so many temporary material designations. And to the extent we identify with these designations, we come under the influence of the forces that control material nature. Passion, ignorance, some goodness. We become fearful. Fearful because we are under the our whole identity is under the control of time. Time is the all-powerful, all-pervading presence of the Lord within creation. In the spiritual world, it is said that time is conspicuous by its absence. But in the material world, time is all-pervading. It's affecting everything. From the subtle most neutrons, protrons, uh, electrons of the atomic particles 
to the mass of planets. From the Indragopa, the tiny little bacterial insect, to Indra, the leader of the demigods. Abrahma Pubanar Loka Punar Avartanorjana. From Brahma Loka to Patala Loka. Everything at all times. There's not a moment anywhere within creation that anything material is not being affected by time. So this is the cause of fear. When we identify with these material bodies or these material minds, Dukalaya Mashashrata, everything is perishing. No one can hold on to anything. Life is so short. We try to make the most out of it. But if we look at the pages of history, how many thousands of years have passed just in our very um, minute understanding of history by academic scholars. Our lifespan is insignificant. And if we read the more broader conceptions of history, as we find in the Vedas, the Puranas, the Mahabharata, the Srimad Bhagavata, we realize our lifespan is totally insignificant. But But still, human life is the most precious thing in all of creation. Because human life has especially been given the blessing in which we have the opportunity to realize our eternal self, Satchit Ananda that we are eternal, full of knowledge, and full of bliss. And the Sanatan Dharma, the eternal nature of the Self, which is the loving service to the Supreme Self, or Krishna. This is the opportunity that we have. But in order to realize that opportunity, in order to know Krishna, to love Krishna, and to experience Krishna's love for us, we must somehow or other come out from the covering of the ahankar, or the false ego. The false ego is like a dark cave. Krishna's grace is like the shining sun. It is shining always for everyone. When Krishna says that he reciprocates according to our surrender, Krishna's love is infinite for everyone, always. His reciprocating is according to how much we want to reciprocate with his love, According to how we open our hearts, come out of the cave of our false ego, Krishna simply reveals that love to us. Suhrida Sarvadehina. Krishna tells in Gita that he is the best well wishing friend of everyone. Now, a true well wishing friend, whether we are healthy or diseased, whether we are in success or failure, whether we are in enlightenment or illusion. A friend's love for us is always. Srila Prabhupada wrote, at the end of each letter, your ever-well-wisher. That's a very powerful statement, ever-well-wisher. That means he's a well-wisher unconditionally, whether we follow him or don't follow him, whether we become saints or we fall from our position. 
whether we're able to do great things or small things. He's our ever well-wisher. He's always caring for us. He's always praying for us. He may be pleased by what we're doing. He may be displeased. An ever well-wisher is pleased when we're doing what's good for ourselves and displeased when we're doing something that's not good for ourselves. That's a friend. A friend in need is a friend indeed. Krishna, at the time of death, is willing to be there for any of us if we remember him, if we call his holy name. So Prabhupada is our ever well-wisher. If we hide in the caves of our egos, then we may forget his ever well-wishing, loving <coughs> grace upon us. And in that state we suffer terribly. And that displeases him to see us suffer terribly. And to enjoy material life without connection to our eternal soul also causes the great souls to suffer terribly. In the sense that we are, they see that we are suffering terribly. So ever well wisher means unconditional, always. Reaching hand out, no matter what. It's for our, it's according to us whether we extend our hand to receive or not. So by the gopis giving their clothes and coming out of the water as Krishna instructed, Sarvadharman Bharatyasya. They offered Krishna their pure, eternal souls with love, with no ego, no material designations. And then after this, in the next story of Srimad Bhagavatam, Krishna with his gopas are traveling through the forests of Vrindavan and Krishna is extolling the glories of the trees. How magnanimous, how kind the trees are. How they extend their mercy to everyone. In the sun, in the summer, the trees give shade. In the cold of the winter, they give wood to keep warm. The quality of the tree is anyone who comes to it. The tree is eager to give of itself for their benefit. And this is from a spiritual perspective. This is a very important quality of tatiksha or tolerance. <coughs> In the Vaishnav school, everything we do is samsadir haditoshanam, is for Krishna's pleasure, even when we tolerate. When we tolerate the urges of greed, tolerate the urges of envy, Tolerate the urges of lust, anger. Tolerate the urges of false pride. Tolerate the urges of all illusions. We are doing it to please Krishna. We are not simply doing it so we will not be entangled in suffering. A devotee, whatever, is not concerned with 
wealth or fame or sense gratification or even liberation from suffering. A devotee's eagerness is to please Krishna, to serve Krishna unconditionally. So we tolerate these urges because only then can we really be servants of Krishna. Otherwise, we become servants of the ego, the mind, and the senses. And it pleases Krishna when we are willing to accept inconveniences for the welfare of others. Because after all, paritranaya sadhunam vinashaya chaduskara. Dharma samstapanaradaya sambhavami juge juge. It's only because of his causeless mercy that Krishna comes to this world. It's only out of causeless mercy upon all living beings that Krishna sends his loving devotees to endure so many trials and tribulations within this world. Haridas Thakur, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu expressed that he is the crown jewel of creation. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu told Haridas himself that I am only finding pleasure in this world because of my association with you. And yet, why Haridas had to be beaten to 22 marketplaces? why he was insulted, he was blasphemed, he, so many things were going against him. Srivas Thakur, so many injustices to him. Narottam Das Thakur, Srila Prabhupada, so many difficulties he had to endure so many betrayals among people he gave his heart to. In other religions, Jesus was crucified. These are the Lord's devotees. They endure so much to show compassion to the people who are in bondage. Why? Because that's Krishna's reason for descending into this world. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the internal reasons why he came was to experience the glory. Krishna wanted to experience the glories of Sri Radha's love. He wanted to understand what she experiences when she realizes the sweetness of his love. He wanted to understand what it was about him that awakened such ecstasy in her. This is the most intimate, confidential leela of love between Radha and Krishna that are being manifest in Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. But why does he do it in this material world? For the, especially because he has three external reasons. To propagate the Harinam Sankirtan movement, to fulfill the wish of Sri Adwaita Prabhu, and what was the wish of Sri Adwaita Prabhu, who was playing the role of a devotee? That the Lord descends to give refuge, solace, hope, and shelter to the people who are suffering. To give love of God, love for Krishna, to people who are so much covered by the cloak of the ego. And to fulfill his 
promise in the Gita that he does descend again and again out of compassion. So this is the principle that Lord Chaitanya is revealing to us through the behavior of a tree. There are so many trees everywhere. Not so many in Mumbai. <laughs> There's laws to protect trees because humans are so eager to cut them down for their own um, conception of progress, to build more buildings, to make more money, to be more comfortable, just cut them down. At one time, this area was covered with thousands and thousands of trees. And the trees never protest. They just cut down. They just cut down and just for people's profits. You cut down trees, then you build a building and you sell the flats and the apartments and you make millions of dollars or millions of rupees. And in the meanwhile, you sell the wood of the tree and make a few more wood and rupees. Who cares? So in some places, they actually have to make laws to protect the trees. Even in Brindavan, people were even today, recently cutting down the forests, the beautiful forests of ancient trees, even trees where Krishna had his leelas, that doesn't matter, just cut them down and make a few rupees. And some, some of our dear devotees were actually fasting, having kirtan and fasting until the government made laws to protect certain areas of the forest from cutting down the trees. But the trees didn't protest. But thinking people, we have to, we have to protest. Not only all the explanations of how trees give, but so much of the oxygen that human beings and all, all living beings on this earth planet breathe all over the world are very much determined by the offerings given by the trees. So well, we may not notice the trees so much because of their apparent silence. But Krishna, he is noting the qualities of every tree. And he's not telling us to cut the trees. He's telling us to become like the trees in the sense of being tolerant and being giving. And then the next story, which is like an evolution of instructions, is the one we are reading today. Krishna and his little friends are wandering through the forest and they have become very hungry. Now, as it has been explained in the previous classes here at Radha Gopinath Temple, through the past verses that have been explained, a true devotee is always thinking of what pleases Krishna. And it's, it's true that we have our own 
experiences, especially while we're in this world and in these bodies. We have different experiences of the mind. We have different experiences of the body. And it's artificial just to try to ignore and negate them because they're there. We can only negate for a certain amount of time. But the nature of a devotee is to see all of it in relationship with Krishna. If the cowherd boys are feeling a little hungry, what is their consciousness? That means Krishna must be hungry. Because we've been here this long. Yeah, they're not seeing Krishna as God. They're seeing Krishna as a loving friend. They know he's God, but they're beyond that. Krishna has fully revealed himself as God to them and now beyond. Now I'm just your loving friend. So if they're feeling a little hungry, they're not thinking, oh, I need food. They're feeling a little hungry and they're thinking, Krishna must be hungry. And their main concern is that Krishna has food. Sometimes we're the opposite. <laughs> we're hungry and then we make an offering to Krishna and we're... <laughs> think, Krishna, I'm offering this to you because I'm so hungry. <laughs> And then when the plate is on the altar, we're thinking, God, there's still seven more minutes till, <laughs> till Krishna finishes. <laughs> and then as soon as that seven minutes expires, oh, Krishna, thank you. <laughs> That's all right, because you're acknowledging Krishna first. That's good tapasya. Don't be ashamed if you're like that. Be happy. <laughs> but at the same time, understand and focus on the standard that our real goal is that if we're feeling hungry, we should be thinking, oh, how much Krishna should be hungry. And Prabhupada explains, as we actually make spiritual advancement, when we offer Krishna nice prasad or boga, then we become completely satisfied. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, in the role of a devotee, on many occasions, devotees would make an incredible feast, and they knew they had to offer it to Krishna first before Lord Chaitanya would take it. So they would have an amazing feast, whether it was Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya or Sri Advaita Charya or Shivananda Sain, they would make wonderful feast, Raghava Pandit. And Lord Chaitanya, he would see it and he would be so happy. He said, I'm so happy that Krishna had such a feast. Now just give me some boiled vegetables and little plain rice. That's all I need. I'm happy that Krishna ate so nice. And the devotees would, they made it for Lord Chaitanya. Because as far as they're concerned, he is Krishna. Because he is Krishna. They said, no, no, you take. He said, I am sannyasi. I only take little boiled vegetables. You've, I'm happy that Krishna ate so nice. And Sri Advaita would say that, but Krishna wants you to taste everything he tasted. <laughs> so that was a good argument. It will please Krishna if you eat everything. So because his devotee is saying this, he's honoring his devotee so much, if it pleases Krishna that I eat every preparation, then I will do it for Krishna. And he would. And he would take, and Adoitu would try to give more, and 
he would say, no more, and Adwaita would say, Krishna will be happy if you eat more. <laughs> <laughs> and he would eat more, not for himself, to, but to please Krishna. And a more deeper, intimate understanding of this is Das Das Anu Das, which is Mahaprabhu's teaching and his spirit. Because it pleased, because pleasing a devotee is what pleases Krishna. So Advaita Sarvabhoma, they are saying, if you eat all these things, Krishna will be happy. And Mahaprabhu, if I please you, Krishna will be happy. So he would eat it in this way. Of course, he didn't do that with Jagadananda Pandit. <laughs> so he, Jagadananda Pandit would give him all kinds of sense gratificatory things, and Lord Chaitanya would say, no, no, I cannot take. So devotees, you see, in our scriptures, in our Vaishnava philosophy, in our histories, you can take one side or the other and really become a soldier to defend it. But there's harmony. On one hand, Lord Chaitanya was extremely strict to not accept any kind of things that are pleasing to the body to show what renunciation is. On the other hand, to please his, and in doing so, he very much displeased his devotee, Jagadananda Pandit. But then when Jagadananda Pandit started fasting, because Lord Chaitanya wouldn't accept the oils and the bed, then Lord Chaitanya would go to him and say, just cook whatever you want and I will eat it. <laughs> And then when Jagadananda was feeding him, it says Lord Chaitanya kept eating more in fear. <laughs> that if he didn't, Jagadananda Pandit would fast again. So there's, there's a very fascinating balance <laughs> that we learn through these wonderful pastimes. So the boys, if they feel hungry, their immediate thought is, if I'm feeling hungry, Krish, what Krishna must be feeling? It's the nature of love. It's like Srila Prabhupada explains that a mother's love, a good mother, because <laughs> this is Kali Yuga, there's so many varieties of mothers. <laughs> but a good loving mother, their love is very indicative. It indicates the nature of the love of the soul for Krishna in the sense that it, it is selfless. It's like if a mother is with her little baby and, it's, and they're both dressed kind of the same way. Of course, different sizes. <laughs> and it's freezing cold. And the mother's really feeling cold. What is she going to think? Is she going to think, well, you know, I'll put my baby down somewhere and put blankets on myself and get warm? No, she, before she even thinks anything about herself, because she's cold, she's thinking the baby must be cold. My baby. If it's extremely hot, she's going to be thinking, my baby must be very hot. That's the nature of love. And in bhakti, even our own experiences in this world, if we're not totally dead to them, <laughs> to our experiences in this world, then even them, they are, um, they incite our remembrance of Krishna in very special ways. The 
just like there was some, there has been some temples within our society worldwide where an earthquake strikes. And everything's moving and things start, and the building starts crumbling. And it's one thing that devotees think, um, let me get out of here. But for the more advanced devotees, they immediately, based on realization of the philosophy, they practically instinctively ran right to the altar to pick up the deities and take them out. Because they felt the experience of the earthquake about to destroy their life, they immediately thought Krishna's life. This is bhakti, this type of reciprocation. And even if you don't feel it yourself, if Krishna may feel it. So the gopas, they approached Krishna and said, we are so hungry, please save us. Oh, Balaram, you are so powerful and strong and the performer of heroic deeds. And oh, Krishna, you are so kind and loving to all your devotees. Please extinguish this hunger from our hearts. And they really, sincerely, came before Krishna like they were really hungry. Because if they said to Krishna, we think you're hungry, so we want to get some food for you. Krishna would probably say, oh, I'm not hungry, let's play. But if they say we're hungry, then Krishna would say, oh, then here is the way to get food. So in this way, you know, the gopis would dress beautiful. Not so that they could look in the mirror and say, I am so beautiful. <laughs> I could be a Bollywood star. <laughs> I could be a front page of magazines. They were not thinking. They would look at themselves in the mirror just to see, will Krishna enjoy my beauty? Their every move, their every word, their every decision was only for Krishna's pleasure. Because ultimately we want to crave Krishna the best that we have. Every devotee we try to be clean because it pleases Krishna when we're clean. So they approached Krishna in this way. We are so hungry, please save us. Because you always save your devotees. And Krishna is telling them that you should go. He was thinking in his mind that the wives of these Brahmins who are doing yagya are my great devotees. I will fulfill their desire but just see how he does it. He tells the boys, go to the Brahmins who are performing the sacrifice and ask them for food. Because actually it's an auspicious time for them to give the food and charity. And when you, when you go to them, Balaram is a Jatriya. So say Balaram is hungry. And, and I'm also hungry. <laughs> so in these verses, <laughs> the little boys, they go to the Brahmins and O oh, earthly gods, please hear us. We cowherd boys are executing the orders of Krishna. 
and we have been sent here by Balaram. We wish all good for you. Please acknowledge our arrival. In today's verse, Lord Ram and Lord Achuta are tending their cows not far from here. They are hungry and want you to give them some of your food. Therefore, O Brahmins, O best of the knowers of religion, if you have faith, please give some food to them. And then they explain how it was actually a very auspicious time in their sacrifice to give food. And the Brahmins, they heard the supplication and they, they didn't even acknowledge the existence of the car boys. Which was really an insult. It's one thing to say, oh, little boys, you know, sit down, you know, it's re we're really too busy now, if you can just wait for some time. Or it would have been better if they said, oh, yes, here it is, or we'll call our wives, they'll get it for you. But they didn't, they didn't look at them. They didn't say a word to them. They totally ignored them because they felt what they were doing was so important. It was such an elevated activity performing these sacrifices. They were totally fixed in the materialistic purposes of their sacrifices. Now, they were Brahmins. They were extremely pious, extremely moral, extremely ethical by all material standards of worldly dharma. But the boys, even though they could sense that these Brahmins were stuck in material conceptions, it even says, before the Brahmins said anything, the boys said these things, but in their hearts, it says there was a typal sarcasm. But still, they didn't say it in a sarcastic way. They said it in a very respectful way. And it's very interesting. They, the, the cowherd boys, who are Krishna's intimate, loving associates, are calling these people, O oh, earthly gods. Please acknowledge our arrival. O oh, best of the knowers of religion, so they're praising them very nicely. And in one sense, Prabodhananda Saraswati, he explained this is how we should preach to important people. And everyone thinks they're important in their own ways. He says, first you put straw in your teeth. And actually, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, when he sent his very senior, learned sannyasis to the West. This was the method he told to spread Krishna consciousness in the West. Take straw between your teeth. Go before people. You are very learned. You are very cultured. You are very um, great. But now forget all you know and just hear the message of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So first you open their hearts. Not to flatter them, but to serve them. Because generally, for most people, for almost all people, unless you respect them, they are not going to respect you. Unless you acknowledge their needs, acknowledge who they are, and unless they feel some sort of either sympathy or appreciation, then most people, their minds and their hearts will just 
be blocked from really receiving what you want to give them. It's human nature. The boys didn't go up to the Brahmins and say, you hypocrites. <laughs> <laughs> they actually were hypocrites. The boys knew it. They didn't go up and say, you hypocrites. You cheaters. You rascals. <laughs> if you don't give Krishna food, you're going to suffer. They didn't do that. They said, oh, earthly gods. <laughs> now, Srila Prabhupada, he was expert. He would tell us sometimes people were rascals. Yes? But then when he meet them, he would be very respectful. <laughs> very much the history. You know, like, you know, this. he said certain things about Indira Gandhi to the devotees. But when he met Indira Gandhi, your excellency. <laughs> <laughs> and essentially, in, after saying nice things, he would tell her the same thing, but in ways that she actually, yes, it's true. <laughs> So it's not that this is some sort of duality. It's just being effective. You know, he, he teaches the inside devotees certain things that we could learn, that we have to be beware of. But when he's actually approaching people, he's, in other words, he's doing what is most beneficial according to the audience he's speaking. Certain principles are the principles of rascals, according to Prabhupada. So he would teach us like that. But when he would approach the people, you know, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, when the governor of Bengal came to Mayapur, he didn't say, you are a meat eater. Manu Samhita tells this is what's going to happen. You are taking intoxication. You are Malacha, you are Yavana. It's all true. In his lectures, he explains all this stuff. <laughs> but when the governor came, he had, a, he had a kirtan waiting for him, and he had everybody dressed up in a special way, and he had a banner saying, God bless the king. Because <laughs> he's representing the king. And he had a banquet and treated him. And the governor did so much service for Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati and so much service for Krishna. So if we want to if we actually want to reach people, we have to somehow or other open their hearts to receive according to time, place, and circumstance. So the boys are calling these Brahmins earthly gods and the knowers of the true principles of religion. Hare Krishna. Should I continue or is that... <laughs> but even in their very loving, compassionate passionate will to serve Krishna, the Brahmins totally ignored them. Which is another good lesson. They actually really humbled themselves to open the hearts of these Brahmins because they wanted to engage them in Krishna's service, which is actually exactly what all of us are doing in our interfacing with the world. We're trying to engage people in Krishna's service. Yes. And <clears throat> in this case, the Brahmins, they want them to give some food to Krishna. So whether we're asking people for food or for funds 
or for some of their intelligence or some of their influence or some of their time, whatever it may be. You know, devotees are beggars, begging people to give some of their hearts, their lives, in whatever form it may manifest, to offer to Krishna. Because it's, because Krishna's happy. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he told us his greatest happiness is when we give love, love for God to others. And giving love for God to others is engaging people in God's service. When we induce people to chant Krishna's name, that's yagya sankirtana. It's a sacrifice. When people actually chant the holy names of the Lord, that's a sacrifice. And all sacrifices, the Gita says, are meant for the pleasure of Vishnu. So they're actually giving some of their time, they're giving some of their energy, they're giving the power of their speech, they're giving the power of their mind, they're, they're giving so much when they chant the holy names. It's an offering, and Krishna receives it. But what we're going to read in the coming verses, and since I'm not going to be here, because I'm leaving tomorrow for the West, and since many of you are not going to be for the following classes, I am going to um, step over my position and speak about the future verses. <laughs> briefly, so that those of you who can come to the future classes will, because our scholarly brahmacharis speak with great eloquence. <laughs> they were so polite. They did everything with honor and respect to open the hearts of the Brahmins because they really cared. They didn't just do it ritualistically. They didn't just say, oh, earthly gods. Oh, best of knowers. <laughs> they said it with feeling because they really wanted to get that food for Krishna. And if you really want to do something for Krishna, you have to do it in a way that, that the best possibility that it will work. Yes, and so in a similar way, you know, when we're trying to reach people with the message of bhakti, we have to do it in a way, somehow or other, the best possibility that will work, in a way that will please Krishna. There's a fine line. We can't, we can't compromise our teachings. The Siddhanta has to be as it is, otherwise we're not representing Krishna. But how we prepare people's hearts to receive it, that is something that Krishna gives us the intelligence to do properly. There's the famous story of of some of the early devotees. They were, they were getting initiated, two brothers. And their mother came for the initiation. Prabhupada told them to invite their mother. Now the mother takes intoxication, and the mother eats meat, and the mother doesn't believe in Krishna at all. And the mother probably gambles. And you know, in Prabhupada's lectures, he's talking against these things. Yes. So he could have said, oh, you know, he could have said all these things in her face. But what did he say? He told his sons, go, just as in the middle of the initiation ceremony, he said, go and touch her lotus feet. 
He didn't say lotus. He said, <laughs> he said, go and touch their feet. The boys were shocked. Because they were kind of thinking their mother was a demon. <laughs> And Prabhupada's saying, go and touch your feet. And they did. And what a lesson that was. The mother's heart completely melted. And this one devotee said, another time he went after this, he went to visit his mother at her house. Probably to ask her for some money or something. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure the details. So he went to the house and he rang the doorbell. Doom, doom. And she came and opened the door and she looked around and nobody was there. She was confused. The reason is he was doing his dandavats <laughs> to his mother. She looked around, who's here, who's here? And then she looked down. <laughs> what are you doing? I said, my Guru Maharaj told me I should bow down to you. So this is, and how much he completely conquered her heart by doing that. So, um, they really wanted to please. In this case, Brahmananda Prabhu and Gargamuni Prabhu were doing it to please Prabhupada. And Prabhupada was instructing them in such a way because this is, this is very much the spirit of a preacher. To somehow or other gain people's re respect and faith by showing respect and appreciation for whatever little we can find in them or much. So, <clears throat> and when, when Prabhupada chastised someone, it would have such fantastic effects because they really felt he cared and loved them. That's why his chastisement had such positive effects. Because directly or indirectly, people had such confidence that he really cares about me. So, the boys did everything for Krishna's pleasure with honor and respect and asked in such a nice way and even proved shastrically how it would be very good for them if they give. They totally ignored the boys. Didn't even acknowledge their existence. They were so proud. What a, contra what a contrast. They're kind of sandwiched in between in that sense. They're in between. First there's the gopis who completely show total egoless surrender. And then after is going to be their wives, who are practically equal to the gopis in their egoless surrender. And in between are the brahmins, <laughs> who are supposed to be the gurus of society. And they hear Krishna's name. They hear Balaram's name. They see the boys. The boys are saying they're hungry. Krishna and Balaram are hungry. And the Brahmins are thinking, we are doing something so important. They were fixed on getting liberated from material sufferings and getting more prosperous heavenly pleasures in this world. And they were very much, according to karma, kanda, performing their yakyas. <coughs> they weren't like professional Brahmins. Well, you know, you pay them and they'll do it. And if you give a, 
if you give them some extra, they'll put more ghee in the fire. <laughs> they were doing it really because they were real Brahmins in that sense, in the Karmakanda sense. They were doing everything expertly, everything meticulously, every mantra, yantra, tantra was precise. But they were so engrossed in that, so engrossed in their pious material pursuits that they didn't acknowledge that they were offending these little children and they were disappointing Krishna and Balaram. Vedaishya sarvair aham eva vedyo. All the Vedas, Krishna is to be known. Yat karoshi rasnasi yat jahoshi dasiya. All sacrifices, whatever we do, is only really meant to be an offering to Krishna. Vasudev is the goal of all yajnas. These are all scriptural statements. He's the goal of life in every way. So this is the common situation with religions all over the world. Including right here in India. Everywhere. It's just human nature. As we take things cheaply. We see the thing we're doing and we forget the purpose it's meant to be done. We become distracted. Krishna tells in Bhagavad Gita that people get distracted by the flowery words of the Vedas. Sarva dharma mami kam Abandoning all dharma means all of our religious practices in one sense. It doesn't mean we stop doing our religious practices. It means we don't, it means it's all meant ultimately for one purpose, to surrender to Krishna, to please Krishna, to serve Krishna, to love Krishna, that's all. But they did not understand that. So the boys were extremely disappointed and they ran back to Krishna and they told Krishna that they didn't even acknowledge that we exist. And Srila Prabhupada and Sri Krishna encouraged them. He said, when you are a beggar, sometimes people give, sometimes people don't give. Just like Prabhupada said, Krishna doesn't see everything we offer. He sees the intent, the purpose in which it is offered. So even if apparently we fail, actually we're a success if we please Krishna. And Krishna is, by, by the character of our intentions, Krishna is pleased. In this state, Krishna tells them, go to their wives, because they are my unalloyed devotees. Now the wives are just at home, because the Brahmins would not allow their husbands to be directly involved. They would just do the things on the side to assist them. And it was in the middle of the yajna. And the wives were expected to just, you know, prepare things in the background and have them sent. And the little boys, Krishna didn't say that he, he, he just said, just tell them that we're here. Just go to these Brahmins' wives and tell them that, that, that myself and Balaram are nearby. Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur very beautifully tells how Krishna didn't tell the boys to say that they were hungry. Because if the ladies found out that Krishna and Balaram were hungry, they would be in great distress. Krishna didn't want them to be in distress. 
he knew as soon as that they heard that they were close by, they would immediately bring food because they were so eager to see him, so eager to serve him. But the boys couldn't contain themselves. <laughs> they went and said, Krishna and Balaram are hungry. <laughs> Krishna had his, Krishna wanted to protect the feelings of the hearts of these ladies. But the boys, they were just so enthusiastic to absolutely make sure that they would bring food to Krishna. <laughs> <laughs> so you see, there's unity and diversity in this sense. They're both perfect. It's not that the boys disobeyed in one sense. They were doing it for Krishna. Krishna's feeling for the devotees, the devotees are feelings for Krishna. But ultimately the boys knew, distress or no distress, if they bring food, then they will be most fortunate. So as soon as the wives heard this, that Krishna and Balaram are close by and they're hungry, immediately they got many, many vessels of food and they all started pouring toward the forest. It is described like rivers, many rivers are flowing to the sea, many Brahmins' wives are flowing to Krishna. And they all had their pots on their heads and their pots in their arms. And every one of them, husbands, brothers, sons, fathers, so many people tried to stop them. What are you going? Where are you going? You can't just go into the forest. Your husbands are doing yajyas. They didn't say anything. They just went. And they knew by doing so, they may never return. Their anticipation, their enthusiasm. As Srimad Bhagavatam tells us, they had never, none of them had ever seen Krishna before. They were willing to surrender everything for Krishna just because they heard about him. Because sometimes these ladies, they would go to the marketplace to get flowers or fruits and some Brijabhasi gopis were sometimes there selling or sometimes people who had heard from the Brijabhasi gopis and all the Brijabhasi gopis and all the Brijabhasis, all they would do is talk about Krishna. Jivwe Bhiva Swami Tamata Deva Govinda Dhamo Dharamata Veti This is the mood of the gopis and the gopas of Vrindavan. My dear tongue, please taste the nectar of the sweetness of the names of Govinda Damodar and Madhava. 24 hours a day they were talking about Krishna, talking about his qualities, his beauty, his character, his pastimes. So these Brahmin's wives, directly or indirectly from the gopis, they would hear about Krishna's transcendental nature. And just by hearing, they completely fell in love with Krishna. They totally surrendered their hearts to Krishna. Because Krishna's pastimes are not different than Krishna. Krishna's names are not different than Krishna. The love of Krishna's devotees is not different than Krishna. And this is the best way to, to, to develop our love for Krishna. Their love was fully awakened. They simply wanted to serve. They simply wanted to surrender. They simply wanted to be with Krishna. So as soon as they got this invitation to, to do some seva, direct seva, they left everything. Nothing could stop them. As they were rushing through the forest to reach Krishna, to serve him, they saw Krishna walking with his friends. Then they came to a clearing near the bank of the Yamuna in the forest. Krishna was standing. 
He had a beautiful bluish complexion like a freshly formed monsoon rain cloud. His garments were brilliant like gold. He had minerals decorating his body, peacock feather on his hair, and other peacock feathers sometimes decorating various parts. He was decorated with fresh flowers, leaves. He had a garland that, that extended below his knees of wild flowers from the forest of Vrindavan. He was standing with one hand on the shoulder of a cowherd boyfriend. The other hand was twirling a lotus flower. He had lilies, fragrant flower lilies, hanging over his ears. And as they looked upon him with his beautiful lotus-like eyes, he gazed upon them and smiled. The sweetness of that smile expressed how he was so pleased with them. That smile inundated, drowned them in happiness, ananda, ecstasy. And they were so grateful. It described that those ladies through their eyes, they brought this beautiful darshan of Krishna into the very core of their hearts. And there in the core of their hearts, as they were just standing, to a person who was just observing, they were just standing looking at Krishna. But what was going on is in the core of their hearts, they had brought the form of Krishna through their eyes and with their hearts, with their souls, their body, mind, words, life, they were embracing Krishna. And Krishna was reciprocating and embracing them. Such a meditation. And Krishna thanked them said, thank you for coming. You may sit down and be comfortable, and you may give the food to us. So they were so happy. You have taken so much risk and so much trouble to come all the way here. I am so grateful to you now. Please be comfortable and sit. And, we, and give us your food. So they all made their offerings to Krishna. And after fulfilling all of their desires, Krishna told them that this is the very perfection of life. What you have done is the right thing. You have offered your love. You have offered your devotion. You have risked everything for me. Now that you have fulfilled the highest aim of life, you may go home because your husbands need you. They're in the middle of the sacrifices and they require your help. They didn't want to hear that. In their own loving, humble, gentle ways, they revolted. They said, Krishna, no, we don't want to go home. <laughs> In serving you, it's like serving the, it's like watering the root of the tree. Automatically everything, all, our, our love, our service goes to every living being. They didn't use these words, but in more or less, more or less they were saying like this. But this is a great example for all of us. This idea of watering the root of the tree when Krishna is satisfied, yes. It's like putting water on the root of a tree and our love, our service, our compassion, our everything goes to all parts of the tree, all living beings. <coughs> Krishna didn't argue with that. Yes, it is true. 
What you've done is perfect and complete. But still you have your duties in this world. You, per you must perform your duties in this world, but watering the root of the tree in this sense means always remember me. He said, the true perfection of your life is not going to come by your physical proximity with me. It's not by being physically close to me. The true perfection of your life is in pleasing me, in worshiping my deity form, in hearing my glories and teachings, in chanting my glories and my holy names, in remembering me and meditating upon me. That is the process that you will actually be always with me. This is a very important instruction. It doesn't really say anywhere in Srimad Bhagavatam whether these Brahmins' wives ever really were with Krishna very much after this incident. Physically. But we can understand they were always with Krishna in their love. And this brings such great hope for everyone. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur told us, do not try to see Krishna. Try to serve Krishna in such a way that Krishna is pleased to see you. And Krishna is in our hearts. In fact, Krishna is everywhere. <coughs> He's in the hearts of all of his devotees. He's in the hearts of all living beings. Krishna is seeing us constantly. But the question is, is Krishna pleased to see us? And Krishna here is telling, by worshiping my form in the deity, which is non different than me, by meditating upon me, that meditation, remembrance of Krishna, by remembering Krishna, that's non different than Krishna. By hearing from Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, by hearing from great saints, by hearing each other discussing Krishna, by chanting Krishna's names, by performing Sankirtan. This is the way we will always be together. He said, this is the way to develop true love for God. not by physical proximity. And Srila Prabhupada very much stressed in relation to Krishna, in relation to himself, our founder, Acharya Guru, <coughs> the difference between Vani and Vapu. Vapu is the physical proximity. When the physical proximity is invited, we should be very enthusiastic to do it. We should, oh, I'm too busy. Because when Krishna called them, they came. And if he called them any time after, they wouldn't say, no, no, I am doing my job. <laughs> they would come any time he called them. <laughs> so when he called, but being with Krishna, and same with gopis, Krishna called them for the Rasa Lila, and he basically spoke almost the same words to them. But the gopis wouldn't leave. <laughs> but then Krishna left them and went to Mathura <laughs> for hundreds of years, for a hundred years. So ultimately, the gopis, why didn't they leave Brindavan and go to Dwarka? Why they didn't leave Vrindavan and go to Dwarka? Because Krishna wanted them in Vrindavan. 
and by hearing about Krishna and speaking about Krishna and remembering Krishna and doing seva of Krishna in separation, they had the deepest bond of love for Krishna. <coughs> That's Vani. That was Krishna's instruction to them. He had given them an instruction, the Brahmins' wives. Hear about me, chant about me, meditate upon me, serve me, always remember me. And we will always be together. That is more important than the physical proximity. <laughs> And he sent them home. And they took those words and enshrined them in their hearts. And for the rest of eternity, those Brahmins' wives were remembering Krishna in the ecstasy of love and separation forever. And they were united with Krishna, with the deepest reciprocation of love in their separation for forever. They argued, our parents, our husbands, they will never let us back because we abandon them. Krishna said, I will arrange, they will allow you back. So even going back was a great risk. Going there was a tremendous risk, but going back was a great risk. But that was their faith in Krishna. Their faith in Krishna, they abandoned everything to go and see him, and then they were abandoning him in one sense, physically, to go back to a place where they could be abused and punished and everything else. That's what they were expecting. But they were willing to go back for Krishna. But when they did, they were in so much ecstasy. Their husbands saw their ecstasy, and Krishna, in the hearts of their husbands, gave them enlightenment. Because they were scholars of Vedas, they knew what transcendental ecstasy was. When they saw their wives, they said, everything that we're looking for, they have it and beyond. Then they started, con the Brahmins condemned themselves because when they saw the ecstasy of their wives' love, they realized who Krishna was. It's quite similar to the Nagapatnis and Kaliya. Of course, Brahmins are different than Kaliya. <laughs> but ultimately, Kaliya surrendered even more than the Brahmins. <laughs> huh? but, and Kaliya was not Brahminical at all. He made, the Brahmins were very clean. They did, you know, made everything with achmans and cow dungs and yantras, and they made everything perfectly clean as far as possible. And Kaliya was just vomiting poison everywhere he went. Uh, but the, the similarity between both of them is when Kaliya saw the love of his wives for Krishna, he became enlightened. And when the Brahmins saw the ecstasy of their wives' love, they realized who Krishna really was. We are, now, we are scholars of Vedas, but all the Vedas are to know Krishna. And we are so condemned. We are performing all these pujas and all these yagyas and all our mantras and tantras and yantras and mudras and all of these other things and we're reciting the Vedas so precisely and the whole purpose is to please Krishna and as the culmination of all of our Brahminical duties Krishna sent his friends to allow us to serve him and please him and we were so caught up in the rituals which are meant to do that that we completely neglected to please him and serve him. And they were saying, to hell with our yagyas. To hell with our 
recitation of Vedic mantras. We are condemned. The very purpose of everything we do, we have neglected to lovingly serve Krishna and Balaram. But our wives, they are so glorious. They never had the reformatory processes like we did. They never got the same types of high initiations like we did. <clears throat> they never studied the Vedas and the Vedantas like we did. They never performed or were trained to perform sacrifices like we do. They're not honored and respected by everyone as gurus like we are. But they surrendered their hearts to Krishna, which is the goal of life, and we did not. They are so fortunate, we are condemned. And by the influence of their wives, the Brahmins actually surrendered their hearts to Krishna. But, not totally. The last verse of this chapter. Will also be the end of this class. The Brahmins say, we were bewildered by Lord Krishna's illusory potency and thus could not understand his influence as the original personality of Godhead. Now we hope he will kindly forgive our offense. Thus reflecting on the sin they had committed by neglecting Lord Krishna, they became very eager to see him. But, being afraid of King Kamsa, they did not dare to go to Braj. Hare Krishna. Now here is the contrast between them and their wives. Here they realize who Krishna is. And they're actually in their own little way surrendering their hearts to Krishna. But they understood, because if Kamsa found out that they were going to offer respects to Krishna, he may kill them. He may torture them. So they didn't go. But as far as their wives, this, the same principle holds for them. If Kamsa found out that they went, they would have been tortured and killed, but they couldn't care less. Saravadaraman Purityasha. I'll read the purport. Realizing their offense against Lord Krishna and finally appreciating his almighty position, the Brahmins naturally wanted to rush to Braj and surrender at the lotus feet of the Lord but they were afraid that Kamsa would certainly kill them when his spies reported that they had gone to Krishna. The Brahmins' wives were absorbed in ecstatic Krishna consciousness and thus went to Krishna anyway. Just as the gopis simply to dance with the Lord traveled in the dead of night through a forest inhabited by wild animals but the Brahmins were not on such an advanced platform of Krishna consciousness and thus, overcome by fear of Kamsa, could not see the Lord face to face. So this last verse um, highlights the glorious nature of the love of the Brahmins wives. They were willing to expose themselves to the greatest risk, the greatest defamation, 
torture, and even death without consideration for the pleasure of Krishna. This is ahoitaki apratihata. Unmotivated, uninterrupted devotional service. This ap apratihata, uninterrupted by circumstances. We cannot imitate. But this is the nature of the Brahmins' wives. This is the nature of the gopis. This is Vrindavan. Unless we have this kind of love to understand Vrindavan is only theoretical. This is what this is the very basic foundation of Braj Bhakti. Is this unconditional unmotivated love. Apratihata, uninterrupted by any circumstance. Krishna wants their food. If it means they'll be tortured, if it means they'll be abandoned, if it means they'll be killed, those are all circumstances. But my service to please Krishna will not be interrupted by any of these mundane considerations. Very high level. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came to give us this. Even in our daily lives, we could live with this principle. And we can cultivate this consciousness in the association of devotees chanting the holy name. feast program is quickly approaching. <laughs> so everyone please, have you had breakfast prasad yet? Some of you are saying no very enthusiastically. <laughs> Srila <laughs> Prabhupada Ki Jai. Thank you very much. <laughs>